uh, internet fragmentation and digital sovereignty. So, uh, at the first part of our panel, I would like to pass the floor to our online moderator, Pedro uh, Lana. Um, I would just like to ask some help from the uh, technical staff in the room, because Steve Sands is trying to join us here in the Zoom, but he is saying that need some credentials to log in with the general link and the general invitation link and he's not able to join us so if it's possible to get another link so i can send him but uh, since we have a bit of a time pressing issue i think we can start um i would first uh, like to say hello to everyone hope everyone is well, healthy, happy, and fully enjoying this IGF. Um, I'm Pedro de Pejigalana from the Brazilian chapter of the Internet Society. And seeing so many familiar faces here makes me want to be there on site with you. But I'm pretty sure the surname is well represented by my younger sister Alice, who is navigating through this wonderful forum in this wonderful city. So uh, I would like to start thanking my friend Emilia Zaleska from Mask and UPA Jeff Poland for her on-site moderation. And also just a few quick words before the sessions begin. Uh, first time, uh, first the thing about time will be a scarce resource for us. So I will try to be as concise as possible and avoid formalities in the session. And this is also why we'll, we'll, we'll be getting session questions only through uh, the chat and preferentially in Symmetry where you can also vote on each other contributions. I will share the screen here so people can have access to the main matter where they can add questions. Just confirm if you are seeing it. Um, so please scan the QR codes uh, or insert at menti.com the code here that will appear in your screen. And before posing questions, I would please ask you to write your name. And if you would like to ask it yourself on the mic when uh, you are called, or else we will read it for you. So the title of our workshop is Intentionally Provocative. A speed internet is almost by definition something that most of us here at the IGF do not want, even if some people may present many considerations that add layers of complexity to this issue. So why balance this internet with something else? It doesn't seem like an interesting idea. But this wordplay kind of help us remember that one of the hardest difficulties on this debate lies largely in its notable semantic confusion. People often talk about different things when they are saying these same words, and many refer to the same ideas, but with different terms uh, that are not fragmentation, internet sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera. To solve this, many people are trying to build and advocate for more precise technical concepts. Others take a functional approach, trying to bypass the difficulties of the semantic confusion. Others think that too many issues are being lumped together under these concepts, and they are too wide and make us lose precious time and energy trying to find definitions and so on and so on. So there's no better place than a forum that is a space by excellence for discussion, discuss, uh, discussing internet issues to promote uh, this kind of dialogue between stakeholders from diverse backgrounds, putting different perspectives into context and trying to find points of consensus or pursuing some common grammar. And of course, we do this with a spice of youth, uh, youth perspective caring for equal representation of this group in the workshop. That being said, and considering I already spoke too much, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists in the order that they will make their opening remarks, presenting just some of their many qualifications. Speakers will have five minutes each for opening remarks, and then we will proceed to the Q&A part of our session. Our panelists will choose specific questions to answer during two minutes each. When you are 30 seconds away from the time li limit, we will warn you in the chat and Emilia can tap the mic twice as well. 
so, uh, Innocent Adrico is the vice president of the Dear Governments Organization, a member of ISOC's Uganda chapter, and was recently a contractor at ISOC, working on their digital sovereignty projects. Emmanuel Ogu is the president of Dear Governments, a member of ISOC's Nigeria chapter, and holds a PhD in computer science with research focus on cybersecurity. Wolfgang Kling Washter is Professor Emeritus at the University of Aarhus. He was a member of the ICANN Board of Directors and a special ambassador for the Net Mungel Initiative. Steve Sands is the head of sector of internet governance and multi-stakeholder dialogue at the European Commission. Katerina Bufsnowska is an Internet Society IGF Youth Ambassador that was also part of the European Youth Parliament Ukraine. And Milton Miller is a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Public Policy in the USA and a co-founder of the Non-Commercial Users Constituency at ICANN, having twice served as its chair. Uh, so sorry if I spoke any of the names wrong. <laughs> and in a sense, the floor is yours, so we can begin. All right, thank you very much, Pedro. Uh, once again, my name is Innocent Adrico. Uh, besides all he has said, I'm a student too. I'm a student of international relations and I coordinate the Uganda Youth IGF in Uganda. Uh, okay, the Uganda Youth IGF, yeah. Uh, so um, just be, uh, as the session starts, I want to bring to perspective uh, uh, the two areas we are looking at, digital sovereignty and uh, the split internet. I just want to bring up uh, a point on how one can lead to the other. So we all agree that the internet has become a central part of our lives, uh, politically, economically, socially, and uh, it has grown to be stronger than we ever imagined. Yeah. Uh, if you had to ask someone from those years, they, they would tell you, uh, from those years when the internet started, uh, they would tell you they didn't expect that it would be this big. But it is so powerful. We've seen this, ex especially during the pandemic. And uh, I should say this is a reason enough for for countries to assert some kind of authority over certain aspects of uh, of the online space, yeah, just as they do in the offline space. Uh, we see that governments intend to put in policies and uh, implement policies that give them more authority over how parts of the internet work, yeah, uh, especially within their borders, yeah, and this has been termed as digital sovereignty. Yeah. Countries have always defended these actions, um, the, we know the actions, for example, shutdowns uh, by saying, for example, uh, in Uganda, uh, the, uh, during the polls, the internet was shut down, and the reason was um, they, uh, they, they shut down the, the internet for matters of national security. They were trying to see that the country doesn't get into conflict because according to them, uh, the internet was um, was being used to incite violence by 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 the voters or by the the people who are going to the polls. Yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, when you look at that authority, we do realize that it has a limit that tends to end up in another thing. Yeah. As we're going to see, our, our my colleagues here are going to talk more about that. Uh, so. Digital sovereignty, we do agree that it can actually promote uh, a lot of good things like innovation, flexibility within the borders of that country. Yeah. But however, we say the internet model is a border, borderless one. Yeah. The internet cannot exist with borders. Yeah. Therefore, digital sovereignty poses a very great threat to how the internet works, to, to how it operates, and also its usefulness to we. The, the, the users, yeah, and uh, therefore this digital sovereignty can actually lead to frag uh, fragmenting of, uh, of the internet by governments where they decide uh, what parts of the internet or of the online space their citizens can access, for example. I can give you an, uh, an example in Uganda still. Um, there was a time when uh, the government decided that they're going to ban uh, Facebook, so meaning they are, they are 
prohibiting you from using Facebook. You can use other platforms, but you had to use, uh, for example, for some of us who wanted to continue on, the, on Facebook, we're using VPNs. Uh, so uh, these decisions uh, mean that citizens will uh, see and access only what their governments want them to see. Just imagine uh, the, 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 the kind of tempering it would do to the flow of information, yeah? and the, the, the internet way of networking. So now this becomes a state of uh, the split internet that we are trying to also discuss here. And uh, so in simple terms, uh, what we are trying to bring up here is that um, digital sovereignty has some good parts of it, yeah, uh, as I already said, but it is a threat in the other way to, the, to how the internet operates. So at the end of the day, uh, it should be something we, 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 we take cautiously, especially as stakeholders. So I'll just complete my statement by saying, while the internet has remained reliable, uh, our world has become increasingly unpredictable. Yeah, um, Stakeholders uh, uh, from government actors to even non-state actors have taken decisions that threaten the, the, uh, the, the, core, the core values of how the internet is supposed to work. Yeah? So uh, that means the biggest threat to the internet and its functionality now is still with the users that, that created it. So uh, I'll beg to stop there for now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot, Innocent, for this first input to our discussion here today and also for fitting perfectly into the time. And now I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, Emmanuel Ogu, to take the floor. Thank you, Emilia. Good morning, everyone from Nigeria. Uh, I'm Emmanuel. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot use my video due to bandwidth issues, but um, I hope you can hear me correctly. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, yes I'm Emmanuel. Listening to you. All right, thank you. So, um, thank you, Innocent, for that um, wonderful introduction. Uh, when we talk about digital sovereignty, you know, like Pedro was trying to create in the early remarks, you know, there is this uh, misconception around the fact that, uh, or there is this often one-sided viewpoint to the, to the possibility that digital sovereignty could only have negative and adverse consequences. But we have seen um, some applications or some experimentations of digital sovereignty where governments actually have genuine interests and they pursue these interests without um, outcomes that threaten the functionality of the internet and then the digital rights of the citizens who rely on these um, ecosystems within their jurisdictions. But then the, the, the broader consensus or, or the broader conflict that we have rather around the splinternet, which is the other side of the debate, is the fact that not only do these governments, do governments continue to implement these regulations in ways that threaten the interests and the operations of other stakeholders who rely on the internet. We have also began to see some form of impetus and some form of um, audacity, especially within the African space, you know, that, that continues to systematically neglect the effect that these um, actions of the split internet or these actions against uh, in line with the split internet of splintering the internet so to speak continue to um, impact on the citizens you know on a broad scale and then of course it is it is um, there are incentives for why governments often consider splintering the internet the first has to do with uh, Interests of national security, you know, like that which, inter which um, Innocent had shared. We had seen similar incidents in Nigeria as well, where around, um, you know, periods of elections or around periods of um, uh, political dissension, you know, the, the government often takes a focus on the internet as a way of controlling how conversations are held. And, you know, recently we just came out of the Twitter ban in Nigeria, you know, and we saw that not only do do digital rights have have um, 
implications for physical rights or rights in the physical world. We also saw that at the end of the day, if no one is able to hold government responsible for these actions, then we set a precedent, not just in that jurisdiction, but as an example that other jurisdictions can follow in meting out the same consequences to individuals. So basically when you, when you block the internet or when you splinter the internet, you often affect individuals' rights to access information, you affect individuals' rights to pursue economic livelihood, you affect individuals' rights to freedom of association, and then all of these, you know, unite within a framework that continues to undermine democratic principles on a broad scale. And then, you know, another consideration for governments in splintering the internet or in pursuing digital sovereignty in very unsustainable manners or in very along unsustainable pathways is that that has to do with the conform or cancel culture that we see um, popularized in digital spaces um, these days. So basically, governments are afraid of what happens if tomorrow the world expects us to behave in a certain way that we are unable to um, comply with or do not fit the sovereign interests of the country. How do we ensure that you know, our e-government systems, our digital economy is not affected by um, actions that the world may take against, against um, them in this, in this um, dispensation? And then we see the regrettable um, and very unacceptable situation of Russia and Ukraine, and then other conflicts that we see between the US and, and China, and then um, the US and Iran. And then we see that, you know, governments begin to have growing incentives for, okay, let's, let's look for ways to consolidate our interests, our data, our networks, the transmissions that we have, let's have some control over them. But then one recommendation that I would want to leave with is the fact that on the backs of the splinternet, we do not have an internet anymore. So by the time we splinter the internet, we end up with a framework that not only blocks or cuts that jurisdiction out from the rest of the world, effectively, you know, of course, making um, transmissions more difficult to reach or making transmissions more difficult to um, share across these spaces and across boundaries. But then we also end up with a situation where digital rights or physical rights are impacted at the same time in such a way that um, users get to begin to, or internet users get to get to begin to worry about what the future of the digital ecosystem is gonna be. The impact is economic in the first place because investors begin to lose confidence in the progressive um, or the progress of the digital ecosystem, like we saw in Nigeria during the Twitter ban um, of 2021. And then there are also um, other implications to the sovereign reputation of the country in the eyes of her sovereign or diplomatic neighbors and diplomatic counterparts. I would like to drop the floor here now and um, hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And now I would like to pass the floor to Volkan Kleinvesto, who is here with us today on site. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me here in this uh, endless chain of uh, workshops on internet fragmentation. Petro, in his opening remarks, said, you know, that uh, there is also a risk that we end up with more confusion than clarification, uh, because the uh, terminology fra internet fragmentation and splinternet is now very popular and different people have a different understanding. And my hope is that the uh, IGF here uh, can contribute uh, to bring more clarity to the debate because it's an important debate and we have to face challenges which come with uh, internet fragmentation or what people, what some people understand under internet fragmentation. Basically, in my eyes, that's the conflict uh, which was raised already 25 years ago uh, by Manuel Castells in his uh, very good book, The Network Society, when he said we have states and we have networks. States are hierarchies and are based on uh, state sovereignty and networks are networks, they are borderless. Uh, and uh, so that means we have these two different, uh, let's say, organizations in the world. So we have networks which ignore borders 
and we have states which have borders. And this brings a conflict. And uh, what we uh, have now in our world is that we have on the application layer, we have one world and 193 national jurisdictions. But on the transport layer, we still have one world, one internet. And I think this is um, a reality, uh, um, a contradiction we have to face. So probably the dreamers and fathers of the internet had the idea that the one world, one internet philosophy will move upwards and we will have a harmonized world, one world, one global jurisdictions. But uh, to be realistic, so this is not the case. So the divergent interest, economic interest, political interest, religious, history, cultural, and all this. So that means we will live with states and national jurisdictions and sovereignty the next 100 years. State will not disappear. So, and that means we have to face this conflict, this one world, one internet. What I see today, and a lot of uh, cases has been mentioned, is there is a risk now that the 193 national jurisdictions will go downwards and try to splinter the transport layer. This is, the, this is a big risk. But on the other hand, you know, um, the reality has shown that uh, with all the attacks against the, uh, uh, let's say, the transport layer, the domain name system, the TCP IP protocol, the IP address system, it's still there. So that means uh, it uh, functions. And uh, as Joran Marby has said in one of the plenary sessions, um, you know, nobody uh, could, even in the, in the pandemic time, um, lament that the internet is down. It has worked. So certainly, you know, some governments have introduced shutdowns, as we heard just now. But is this really a fragmentation of the internet? In my eyes, this is just censorship. This is because, you know, you do not change the uh, basic protocols of the internet infrastructure. You introduce a barrier on the application layer, and this is censorship. This is a violation of the Human Rights Convention, in a thing, but not a violation of the protocols of the internet. So um, I would not say, uh, I, I wouldn't say that there are not risks also for the protocols. We have seen this over the years, you know, it started in the 1990s with an alternate route. Then we had some ideas from the French government to organize an object naming system for the Internet of Things as an alternate to the domain name system. So we did see the handle system and the digital object architecture. This was also an attack. You know, recently China uh, started a debate in the ITU about new Internet protocol. And we have now a debate about blockchain and the .ath domain, which is not in the root, or, uh, but, you know, which could uh, offer an alternative. But, you know, all these uh, efforts to uh, uh, splinter, let's say, the basic infrastructure have failed so far. Even the Chinese proposal on new IP, uh, you know, did not make its way into the ITU plenipotentiary conference in October last year in Bucharest. So the proposal was discussed, but has no majority. And now Chinese papers discuss about so-called polymorphic networks, which are, let's say, nothing else than a network on top of the DNS. So it's not an alternative, but an, an complementary, complementary thing, which, which is interesting. The same happened with the French proposal for the ONS in the uh, 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 2009. So we discovered Internet of Things is an application on top of the DNS and not an alternative to the DNS. And I think this is important to clarify so that you it, there is a need to ring the alarm bells, but you should ring the alarm bells in places where there is a need. Internet shutdowns, this is a, a good reason to ring the alarm bells, but to qualify it is more as a violation of human rights and not as uh, splintering the Internet. So uh, you should be very careful in making uh, these distinctions. So um, I stop here, but uh, we will have a second round that I can add some more comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. There will be definitely more time uh, for both answering uh, questions from the audience and also for the final remarks. 
so now I would like to uh, pass the floor to our next speaker, Steve Sands, who is online with us today. Uh, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I'm sorry I, I joined a bit late. I, I, I represent here the European Commission. I'm the, the head of the internet uh, uh, governance sector. Uh, so I, I think I'm in a good position to say that uh, this is something, that the internet fragmentation is something that uh, worries the EU and the Commission in particular a lot. And we dedicate a lot of thinking about it. And uh, we, I completely concur with Wolfgang that uh, we need uh, some order into this debate because it's extremely, extremely complex and, and conceptual tools and framework that can help us think about this are uh, more than welcome. And actually Wolfgang himself uh, has, uh, has proposed some of these tools in, in uh, seminal uh, papers that, uh, that we take very much into account. And uh, uh, basically what we find it uh, useful is indeed to, to divide the, to classify the trends that we see in terms of uh, internet fragmentation or internet openness or keeping internet openness or internet global which is in the end what matters, in uh, uh, different layers. And uh, these layers uh, are about, you know, the technical architecture of the internet, as Wolfram was saying, but there are also uh, commercial and economic layers. So you can have a completely uh, fragmented internet at the economic level, uh, impacting the companies that operate in, in that internet. You can have a fragmentation on internet governance itself, and you can have a, a regulatory fragmentation. And now to start from, from the last point, which is you know, very visible, potentially controversial, and this is something that the EU as such is, is recognized as a, a one of the uh, regulators of the, of the uh, let's say, application uh, layer of the internet. And yesterday we, had, uh, we organized an open forum actually presenting uh, three of the main uh, regulatory instruments that we are uh, implementing these days. Um, the uh, I think it's we need to recognize, as we do in many documents that deal with digital principles and in the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, etc., that there is this dark side of the internet, and that uh, a completely unregulated application system is not um, is not desirable. It's uh, you know public's, public administrations are accountable to their citizens, and we see. Uh, many things going on online that uh, we did not expect at the beginning of the internet. And I think that uh, Vin Cerf is uh, very brave in recognizing this uh, in every speech that I've seen him uh, recently. And this is something that uh, we all should recognize. And this requires public intervention. A and this public intervention will be always in relation to the uh, values, the democratic processes uh, or not democratic processes uh, that are in place in a given uh, political political community or political institutions. Now, we, don't, we, we do this, we have plenty of examples. We have very complex uh, processes to bring up uh, legislation in the EU that uh, end up mixing interests and perspectives and different cultural backgrounds from new member states and generate a series of legislations that are then actually taken many times as blueprints across, across the world. Now, is this the end point of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, internet fragmentation in, the, in relation to regulation? We think it's not. We think that we should also be very careful about fragmentation in regulation. And to that end, we really think that the common denominator of every piece of regulation on the internet that should be passed across the world is human rights. That's the common denominator. That's something that it's very much embedded in the EU system. Every piece of regulation that we produce has to comply with the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And if it doesn't, it can be brought to court and the court reconsiders the regulation. Human rights are a permanent uh, object of discussion when regulation is passed, and they are the end point of, any, of every internet regulation in the EU. Internet regulations in the EU strengthen human rights. 
we think it's extremely important that this happens across the world. And this uh, should be, and it doesn't happen. It, it's not happening now. So this should be the common denominator to avoid uh, internet fragmentation at the level of regulation. And uh, we work closely with the UN, with the tech envoy, et cetera, because it's, you know, it's really within the UN system that uh, we need to work out that common denominator very clearly in everything that relates to uh, internet regulation. Now, on technical fragmentation, um, this this is, um, as Wolfgang was saying, uh, this is a, you know, it, it, it has happened already. We should be clear that it has happened, not at the level of protocols, not at the level of uh, DNA, DSA, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, the domain name system, etc. It happens with uh, little devices that uh, telecom companies are forced to introduce into their networks. So first, there is a certain level of technical fragmentation by uh, these devices that go into the networks that it's already happening. Some countries apply them, some countries don't apply them. So this is the first realization. Now, is the technical layer of the internet under threat? Uh, our answer is that short term, no, mid term, definitely yes, definitely yes. We see extremely, and this occupies, unfortunately, much of our time, extremely well funded, uh, well thought uh, attempts to really uh, transform core protocols of the internet into something different. Uh, and and this, is a, this is a major risk. To avoid technical fragmentation of the internet, we think it's extremely important to respect and build into the consensus multi-stakeholder model that creates protocols, standards, and core infrastructures of the internet. There needs to be a consensus within these systems to make the internet evolve without falling into a technical fragmentation that we might have it on our plate in the IGF uh, 2026, we might be discussing uh, this uh, very openly. And I tell you that uh, it's, it's really a, a prominent danger that we are fighting as we speak in, in some standardization organizations. Uh, now, on the commercial and economic side, we think that internet markets should remain open, fair, and contestable. This is at the basis of, uh, for example, the Digital Markets Act of the European Union that uh, puts uh, a certain safeguards so that big internet uh, corporations do not take over certain markets, including the European one, but also in general. I think it's a, it's a framework so that local ecosystems, local economic ecosystems could continue thriving without having big corporations taking over. This is um, uh, something that uh, goes hand in hand with the fact that we have a digital divide. Uh, the internet is fragmented by the bare, by the mere uh, fact that many people is not connected. So it's not really global. It's not really open. There are plenty of people who are not connected. So we need a very strong effort as well to disfragment the internet at that level. But these digital transitions bringing everyone online should go hand in hand also with human rights. Uh, we don't want digital transitions for the sake of digital transitions. We want digital transitions that are based on an open internet model underlying human rights, because as we will know the internet, we cannot take it as uh, idealistically as, as in the beginning. It can be used for exercising massive control over citizens or uh, creating a strong uh, protectionist uh, uh, measures. Uh, thank you very much. Looking forward to engaging the conversation. Um, thank you a lot, Esteve. Uh, now, I would like to pass the floor to our speaker, Katerina Bovsunovska. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to echo Wolfgang that it's indeed this session is one of the myriad of internet fragmentation sessions, this IGF. But during the sessions, we were all discussing what is internet fragmentation, what it is, um, main examples on technical level or is it focused on user level or internet governance level and the main question remains unanswered apart from what exactly is internet fragmentation what can we do about that and as a representative of youth 
I believe that we have at least some general idea that these decisions made by governments, they will continue to be made by governments, at least for now, while indeed the world order is based on the state sovereignty in the digital space, digital sovereignty will continue to be existing and we need to influence the decision making process. That's why, for example, this IGF is indeed really important for us because it has a very particular trait of being a multi-stakeholder framework. It indeed tries to collect all of us from governmental sector, from private sector, from youth, from civil society, academia, technical community, and to let us talk together, discuss the critical issues that are uh, relatable to the global internet we face today, and to find some common solutions together. That's why, um, as a youth, we are a very dynamic group. We are really affected by the internet and all of its good sides and bad sides. We have the opportunities presented by internet, and at the same time, we are really frustrated when we are barred from using the other opportunities and chances that we could have used without the decisions taken by someone else without our interests. And in this IGF and multi-stakeholder approach, if you keep engaged, uh, if you keep youth engaged, we are growing up and then we are transforming into other groups. We're becoming young professionals, we go into government, we go into private sector, technical community, civil society, academia, and all of them. And we know how to talk to each other, already prepared during the youth engagement in IGF, in regional initiatives, in national initiatives. We are ready to listen to each other, having our common past as a youth, and we're ready to build common solutions to fight our common problems without infringing the internet. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot, Katerina. <clears throat> and now we will move to our speaker who will close uh, this first round of speakers' input. Uh, Milton Mueller, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Everybody can hear me okay. I'm um, sitting here at uh, four in the morning in the U.S. Um, and um, now I know how people in Asia feel when they are participating in these meetings in strange time zones. Um, I was uh, a little bit objecting to the title of the session. It talks about a balance between digital sovereignty and splinternet. And uh, as Pedro said, this is probably deliberately provocative, but I think there is no balance. If you go for digital sovereignty, you get a splintered net. And I agree with the comments of Innocent and Emmanuel about this. Uh, they already said it well. I think it's very important to include these kinds of uh, African perspectives or developing country perspectives where, you know, the government is really willing to just shut down the internet. And I don't agree with Wolfgang that that does not constitute fragmentation. Uh, the fact that, you know, there's nothing more fragmentary than shutting off the internet and, and refusing to let it operate. Uh, um, now, I think we need to be uh, to pick up on the semantic confusion that Pedro referred to. We do have a tendency to confuse the sovereignty of states, which does exist and will continue to exist, and in some ways is a good thing, with sovereignty over cyberspace. And uh, those are two very different things. As, as Wolfgang said very well, uh, perhaps he was referring to my book called Networks and States, but he said it was all about um, the, the other guy. I can't remember his name. Um, there, there is a conflict between the territoriality of governments and the global technical standards of the internet. But I think one thing I want to contribute to this discussion is that we need to focus more productively on talking about the balance between the state and the market 
in a globalized digital ecosystem. Because what the internet with its global compatibility does, and it's not just the internet, it's all kinds of digital technologies that have been organized on a globally compatible way for three decades now. So what, how do states assert authority over digital markets and digital services uh, when their scope of authority is territorial and the market is transnational uh, and the technical ecosystem is indeed global? So I think there's not a good recognition within the UN system, within the IGF, of the importance of the market uh, in generating capital. In, for example, the, the digital compact talks about giving everybody broadband. Well, it's a very nice thing to say, but if you're going to give everybody broadband, you're going to be investing hundreds of billions of dollars in capital, uh, in facilities, uh, and you'll be taking risks that that money will be lost or, or not used efficiently. So we have to look at, you know, why do people invest? How do they invest? Where does the money come from? And that's a market phenomenon. And we need to develop self-sustaining and profitable industries. You know, it's one thing to complain about the fact that the U.S. platforms are um, you know, so dominant, uh, but the really the only way to uh, approach that dominance, there might be some regulatory measures, but the most effective way is to establish competing and alternative firms, which you have seen, for example, uh, successfully done in China and to some extent in India. Um, so, Again, the, the market phenomena become extremely important. And also it's clearly the market that drives technological innovation and development and efficiency. Now, the thing about markets is that they do not want to be bound by territories. Uh, they want to create more efficient divisions of labor. Uh, and if you look at something like the chip industry, uh, it has been globalized partly because of a World Trade Agre Organization agreement, the ITA, which uh, helps to distribute the supply chain of chips uh, all over the world, but with an emphasis on East Asia. Uh, and there was this huge division of labor between the design uh, and uh, research and development aspect, which is dominated by the US and to some extent Western Europe, and the uh, manufacturing and production uh, in, in other countries. So it's not an accident that historically the most economically liberal countries are precisely the ones with the leadership uh, in telecommunication industries with the most rapid and wide diffusion of telecom capabilities. I'm talking about whether you're talking about Britain in the telegraph era, the US and Scandinavia in the telephone era, and the US with the internet, it is the most economically liberal countries that lead. So the role of government is largely one of setting rules for fair play or for stopping fraud and abuse. Government interventions, however, like markets can be abused and can be failures. Governments are not gods who reach down into markets and automatically fix them. You know, I'm sorry to uh, inform the European Commission of this because uh, sometimes they do seem to think that way. So digital sovereignty is an obstacle in many cases or can be an obstacle to development if it means that foreign capital and expertise and free trade and markets with the rest of the world are going to be blocked and impeded. And it also is an obstacle to human rights if it means that the government is in fact asserting control over what kind of information people can access. And uh, this is an Article 19, you know, uh, basic human right uh, of the international system saying that people have the right to access information uh, wherever they can find it. And sovereignty is the, an assertion of exactly the opposite. It says that the government should have supreme control 
over what information you can play. So the sovereign right of states should not get in the way of the human rights of people in a country, and it should not get in the way of the economic rights they would have to choose the products and services they prefer. So that's what I have to say. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you a lot, Milton. And with this input, we are uh, finishing the first part of our session. And now we are moving to the other one, which is the Q&A part. So uh, in this part, firstly, uh, we will I will collect uh, one question from the floor. Then Pedro will ask one question from the chat. Then uh, we will give our speakers some time to respond to each other if they would like to, because we could heard that there were some agreements, some disagreements. So it might be interesting to actually listen to your uh, next uh, remarks. And after that, if we still uh, have some time, we will take some more questions. So, uh, OK, I see two hands. Okay. 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 So, please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Yi Chen from Beijing Normal University. So basically, I think we have to clarify some concept. I I, I think I agree with Wolfgang, and uh, some way I also agree with Milton. But I think we have to concept. First of all, human rights, freedom of expression. Okay, freedom of expression is a conditional right. It's not a, a you know without any condition. Of course, you can have a freedom of expression, but the state has a right to regulate the content in terms of hate speech, if it's political fee, or if it's a harm content. Of course, therefore, because I study human rights, sorry. Human rights, freedom of expression is not an absolute right, it's a conditional right, okay? So when we talk about uh, the state censorship, just like uh, uh, Wolfgang just mentioned, you know, when they when they shut down, they shut not shut down the access to the internet layers. They're doing the censorship, which means they censor out all this harmful content. Of course, what constitutes as a harmful content? What constitutes as a as a as a, as a propaganda, uh, which is uh, up to, up to debate. But at least we needed to clarify whether they are shut down the layer access or just, just do the filtering of the censorship of the content. And as I said, the content is not uh, freedom of expression, it's not absolute right. So therefore, when we discuss the fragmentation, we have to clarify to what, what do we exactly mean. Because each jurisdiction, each country has a right to regulate you know, the contents on the internet. The internet is the content, the internet is not free of the restrictions. Okay, so this is my first point. So I would like to clarification from our panels. The second thing is about uh, uh, diversity and the fragmentation. We talk about all these uh, industry policy because we talk about uh, like platforms dominating in Africa. Exactly, this is actually is a kind of about uh, industry policy in local. You know, if you want to uh, build up your own industry, you need to have an industry policy which will boost your local industries. Okay, this happened in in 60s, 70s. We have this uh, uh, free flow of information uh, 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 initiated by the UN to help to balance the information flow from the south and the from the from the east. Um, from the west and, uh, and the north, because we, we see there's an unbalance of information flow. We, we, we're facing a similar situation now, because all these data are controlled by the bigger platform from America and China. And the, the small countries, like uh, African countries, they, they need to have their own platforms. Uh, how can they do it? Of course, they have to have the industry policy to help you protect the industry, and, and also antitrust policy to, uh, to, to regulate those big countries. So therefore, I'm, I'm asking, when we talk about fragmentation, where is the diversity? Where is the diversity in terms of uh, regulatory model, in terms of uh, content, also in terms of uh, local industry policy? So I think we, we, we shouldn't uh, make the concept uh, fragmentation so widely spread and also make it so blurred and uh, hijacked for political, different political purpose. Thank you. That's my comment and also questions. Okay, so maybe to clarify, is it uh, a comment or question to any particular speaker or? And also question to like uh, Milton and uh, Wolfgang about whether we think this is a concept. Uh, how about the diversity in you know, local uh, jurisdictions and also these uh, uh, freedom of you know. Okay. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> I see that uh, Milton has his hand up, so Milton, please, uh, the floor is yours. Sure. So, um, hi there, uh, uh, Yek. It's good to see you. Um, I guess you're there on site. Um, I, um, you know, I, I think that this idea that freedom of expression is conditional um, as a factual statement, uh, it is correct. Um, as a normative statement, I think it's a, a rather bad excuse for for censorship. I mean, of course, different countries uh, have different standards. Uh, some countries are extremely repressive in what they allow. And as you know, China is one of those. And to say that, you know, freedom of expression is conditional does not justify the kind of censorship that you see in probably about half to two thirds of the countries uh, in the world today. Um, the, and, and most of that censorship is not about protecting the public interest. It's about protecting people who are in power. And that's precisely what the internet did was it just by accident almost, it opened up all of these new channels of communication to people and there were no mechanisms to control them. And so suddenly people had uh, a widened and broadened right to access and express themselves. And many governments have then in the last 20 years have started to clamp down in various ways. And this of course leads to a, a more fragmented uh, application environment. Um, so that's that's the response I would make. I, I'd be interested to hear from Wolfgang also. Yeah, uh, I would echo um, Milton that we should be very careful in saying, you know, that it's uh, right of governments to control content. Uh, that's a very old story, and it goes back to the invention of the printing press of Mr. Gutenberg 500 years ago. You know, and when he offered his the opportunity to print the Bible, this was uh, seen by the Pope and the Catholic Church with great enthusiasm. He said he could bring the Holy Word to many people. But then people started to write pamphlets against the Catholic Church. And the Pope was not amused. And the Catholic Church introduced the index of censorship, which was, by the way, uh, uh, in, in, in a place until the uh, 1960s. So, and that's the question, who has a capacity to decide what is right and what is wrong? Uh, content. So that means, and this brings an idea which has to be further elaborated in cyberspace about a neutral third party. So that means if just the government decides and says this is good and this is bad, this would undermine uh, the individual rights. If we leave it in the hand of corporations with a Facebook oversight board, this is also bad. Uh, in the democratic system, we have the Parliament, the government, and the independent judiciary. You need an independent judiciary for content-related cases in cyberspace. I remember a very classical case. Uh, I'm from the older generation. Younger people will not remember that. When Daniel Ellsberg from the uh, Pentagon uh, disclosed the lies of the US government in the beginning of the Vietnam War, and uh, gave all the information to the New York Times and they published the so-called Pentagon Papers. And the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, was very angry and he said this will undermine the national security of the United States because the United States was in a war and he called the editor-in-chief of the New York Times and said you have to stop this, you cannot publish this, this is undermine the national security of the United States. But the New York Times argued we have the First Amendment in the U.S. Constitution. So we have freedom of press. So I will publish whatever I think it's, it's important. And the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States and they had a landmark decision, five to four, very close, where the, the, the court argued that the uh, right of people to know the truth is more important than the interest of a government to hide its lies. And I think this is an interesting case which can be, you know, helpful 
to start something to develop uh, for the uh, cyberspace. So we need independent uh, third parties to manage uh, content-related conflicts. And by the way, uh, we had similar conflicts in the early days of ICANN when cyber squatters, uh, you know, took names and then it was complicated how to handle this between cyber law and trademark law. And we in uh, introduced the, the so-called universal dispute resolution policy with a distributed system of uh, so-called uh, 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 dispute resolution service providers with panels. So probably we can develop such a decentralized system for content related cases, not only for cases uh, on conflicts around domain names, but also for content things. This would be innovation in policy making. This would be innovation <laughs> in the judicial system, but it's a long way to go. But I hope with the help of the IGF, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, Emmanuel has also uh, raised his hand. So Emmanuel, please go ahead. Thank you, Emilia. I think one desirable in this um, discussion around um, what what we need to do to clarify concepts is is the is the need to separate political and geopolitical concerns from the operations of the internet. Now, the 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 question had the question had raised the concern about um, freedom of speech um, and the fact that um, governments or um, sovereign authorities would always want to clarify the terms around how freedom of speech or the boundaries around freedom of speech, which is one desirable. But then on the other hand is that to what there is, there is no, there is no boundary to which um, such regulation or such parameters are set by the government around how they're going to uh, control free speech and how are they going to define what entails free speech, particularly in light of the fact that we have seen increasingly seen governments that, um, you know, like like um, Wolfgang was, was trying to um, illustrate with that very beautiful quote about, um, you know, the, the, the right of citizens to um, have a freedom of speech must always over, overtake the interests of governments to hide their lives. And when these two divides, you know, clash at the center, we begin to see freedom of speech infractions. And I've seen the same um, arguments also around um, debates about the right to education. Okay, so a, 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 a communist government would, would likely not want, you know, students in their country to access, to have access to Western education, even though there is that right implicitly or explicitly defined by um, declarations and regulations that are widely acceptable. And probably a Soviet style government or a Soviet attuned government may not want their, their citizens to, um, you know, access Western curriculum or learn what's um, aligned with Western educational system. But then at the crux of this is the fact that by the time we begin to bring in all of these geopolitical and political considerations and interests into discussions around the operations and functioning of the internet, we often relegate the technical considerations that define or should characterize what makes the internet the internet in the first place. And this is the challenge we have had in Nigeria with, with, with government. And then we see, we, we oftentimes see this coming on the backs of well-meaning, well-intended um, desires of government to control issues around hate speech, to control issues around pornography. And of course, these are, these are vices that require decisive actions. But then by the time we separate the technical considerations of what, how, how are these uh, regulations, how are these policies going to impact the internet in practice, in the long run, politically, in terms of digital rights, in terms of um, the, 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 the economic, the, the economic uh, empowerment of the citizens and the access to information. By the time we do not factor in these technical considerations into this debate, and we focus so much on the geopolitical and the political interests that characterize government discussions around these, these issues. We are likely to always end up at this juncture where we are contending digital sovereignty and the split internet and which should go for the other. Uh, thank you to all three speakers who responded to the question. 
and uh, now we would like to give an opportunity to online participants to uh, ask their uh, questions. So, uh, Pedro, if you could uh, read uh, the question from the chat or let the person from the chat speak and ask their question. Perfect. We have a few questions on mint matter that are not identified, but um, I will start with them. And Jean, if you would like to make the question you post there, you posted in the chat a few minutes ago, you can also open your mic or else I will read it for you after reading the ones from Mintimetra. Uh, the first one, uh, there are a few general questions here. So what do speakers think are our best tools to try to solve these technology problems so we can start talking about the same ideas when using these concepts? Is this possible? I think. It's more about giving some precise recommendation. What can we do? Uh, campaigns, uh, making, for example, an IGF uh, guidelines, something like that. I think a bit more concrete on what to do to solve the semantic confusion. Um, the second question so would be, <laughs> Uh, focusing on technical argumentation alone is incomplete, in my opinion. Uh, so what does interoperability facilitate? If govern governments can use the tech layer, they use app layer fragmentation to the same effect. Jim, would you like to make your question? We will have a block of three questions here, then pass on to the speakers to choose which ones they would like to answer. Oh, so Jim said that I can read it for him. Uh, he asked, uh, he mentioned, he made a comment with a question at the, at the end. So digital sovereignty and the internet tends to undermine the internet model. Uh, it is certainly a political question, but it must be said that depending on the horizons, it can also be a question of ethics. And this can be seen as differently according to local cultures. So how to approach this story questions? What are the proposals? Um, so, giving the floor back to speakers, you can answer them all, you can answer a few of them, you can also choose not to answer any in this block of questions, so giving the floor back to you. All right, thank you very much, Pedro. I think uh, I'll take the first question. Uh, because it's just uh, a clear one. Uh, just, but before I answer that question, uh, just to uh, clarify a bit on the um, on the differences. Yeah, one thing I would like to say is uh, it is not a time for us to declare a state of split internet. Yeah, but um, we should rather fear that the the series of of actions by different actors can actually lead to the split internet. So I think that is what we should focus so much on right now, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I think it is not yet time to, to say we already, we already in a state of split internet. Okay, back to the question. Uh, so um, uh, one of the participants has asked what tools they can use to understand uh, about the two concepts. So I should say this is the first platform. I mean, the fact that we are, able to organize um, such a session where we are having speakers with different perspectives, yeah, uh, agreeing or disagreeing, but of course at the end of the day, we are going to be able to understand each other, everyone's perspectives, and be able to take home something new that we never knew. I think that is a good starting point. But also um, taking personal, uh, personal initiative, like uh, for example, I should say there are so many articles that have been written by different uh, stakeholders about split internet and also about uh, digital, digital sovereignty. So um, whereas the arguments might really be confusing from one side to another, I think uh, it's, it's a start of everything, yeah? And I'm very sure at one point we shall be able to reach an agreement that this is actually this and that is that, yeah, thank you. If I may add to the first question as well, um, there is a policy network on internet fragmentation launched last year and they have a mandate for two years. 
and coordinated by Bruna and Shital, and they pre presented the policy network yesterday. And here also, like Wolfgang is one of the members of this policy network, and I believe um, Milton as well. And they are exactly um, debating the terminology and the definitions used for this uh, topic, and they are doing their best to clarify it for us as much as possible. And um, if you want to join them in this effort, you can always uh, join the policy network as it's open, and you could find it just on the IGF website. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Innocent and Katarina, for uh, responding to the questions. Uh, we have something like 10 more minutes for the Q&A part, uh, and I just think that maybe uh, we will connect speakers' responses to each other with their closing remarks, and thanks to that we will have time for some more uh, on-site questions. So, uh, are there any? Okay, I see one here. And here's, okay, we will take two. So maybe, yeah, you can start and then uh, we'll also listen to your question. Hi, hi everybody. My name is Sunit. Um, uh, I work for the Tony Blair Institute. So my question is, I think, first, governments are not homogenous entities and even within national governments, you, you'll have differences of opinion about um, what regulation or policy should look like. So maybe the Ministry of ICT will feel differently from the Ministry of Defence. Uh, I think part of the challenge also is that governments, like all actors, are not necessarily wholly bad or wholly good. Um, and because of the technical complexity and the speed and I guess the, the, the potential harm, I think sometimes governments with good intentions are forced into utilizing blunt instruments like internet shutdowns, okay? Um, and I think part of that is because there, there isn't an ability or a capacity to understand, well, what are the interim instruments that I can use so I can address the situation of harm without potentially causing greater harm or undermining human rights, which I think we all agree is important. So my, my question is um, to whoever is happy to, to, to take it is, if, if, I, if there is significant harm, I don't want to shut down the internet, um, what can I do uh, to, to respond to challenges uh, in a way that is respectful or fair? And what should be the, what should be the starting position for governments in terms of understanding the trade-offs? Thank you. I'll try to be as concise yeah, yeah. as possible, um, but I have some reflections and a quick question. So adding to what Emmanuel said about the genuine interests of states, I would add about mobility, healthcare, and educational platforms. In Brazil, in the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, we are working uh, in the concept of scientific autonomy uh, together with digital sovereignty. So I'd be glad to share this afterwards. I also contribute uh, considering other approaches to sovereignty, such as food sovereignty, that we bring not only uh, the power to the states, but power to the people. Like recently in Brazil, the homeless of um, the movement of homeless workers has just declared what is their perspective about digital sovereignty, for instance. So maybe uh, it's a good time to, to to bring to the table who really should define what development is in the 21st century. Uh, and also the, the title of this IGF is Resilient Internet for a Shared Sustainable and Common Future. So I'd like to highlight that, uh, for instance, the Weizenbau Institute in Germany is working with the concept of sustainable digital future, that besides meaningful access, it's also taking into consideration the carbon footprint of internet communications infrastructure. Uh, Professor Milton said that uh, markets are transnational, but we should warn that l just last week, the US has banned 10 Chinese companies to operate in, in, the, in the territory. Um, and finally, we should bear in mind that digital sovereignty is way broader than internet fragmentation, which is the name of the policy network. I agree with Professor Wolfgang that it's about making change in the lower level protocols. And going to the question, maybe to Innocent and Justina, uh, the, the fact that the most powerful uh, tech US-based companies are jumping uh, down in the lower levels of the, the internet, owning like fiber, fiber optic cables, 
Uh, is it a menace to nut fragmentation? Thank you. And maybe we'll take mm. just one more question to just group them in the block. So also, please. Okay, good morning. Thank you. No, as I said, wanted to address that the, the concept of sovereignty is, is a concept that was born in, in uh, Wolf and surely know better than me, but around century 16 or something like that. And it was uh, uh, the, the, the reason, the objective. <laughs> the, the, the objective was to, to ensure the, the authority, to protect the authority of the states uh, over a territory. Uh, later, much later, it became, uh, it became an, a, a, a form to protect the, the rights of the citizens. But originally, it was to protect the authority, the power. And, uh, and even if it, it has been used, as everybody knows, as, as, uh, exactly with the opposite uh, <laughs> interest sometimes. But so in this, uh, in this new, um, these are uh, the part from the premises, uh, all premises, that, uh, that the, 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 the governments were the only representatives of the interests of the people. But this, in this war, as described by Wolfgang, that uh, we have uh, 193 states but uh, one network, the, the rights of the, of, of, of the people not necessarily uh, are represented or defended by the, by the governments. So the, the rights of the, of the people, that is what really matters, could be uh, opposite, op opposed to the, to the concept of sovereignty. And this is something that the governments uh, uh, should understand. And the, this is the basis of the multi-stakeholder model. That is something that everybody here embraces. And the, my, my last comment is that uh, with regard to fragmentation, I think that it doesn't matter really the definition of fragmentation, what is fragmentation or what is not. And, and the, the proof is that Wolf and Hamilton disagree on, the, on one specific thing, is if the, shutdown, the shutdowns are or not fragmentation, but both of, both of them agree that this is something bad. So the, I think that we should concentrate our efforts in discussing what is right and what is bad, and, and rather than the, 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 the concrete definition. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So any of the speakers who would like to uh, respond? Yes, sure, I, may I take the first question? OK, yeah, so uh, yeah, the first question uh, was pertaining to how do well-intending governments or governments who have good intentions, how do they go about um, scrutinizing the, the regulatory policy proposals, you know, so that some of these um, negative outcomes of this internet are averted. Um, I would I would like to introduce to the floor um, a toolkit provided uh, recently developed by the Internet Society, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. Um, this toolkit, you know, uh, basically provides a, a checklist of five desirables, five principles that have um, ensured that the internet has, has continued to grow and develop sustainably over the years. Um, and with these uh, toolkits, governments are able to assess their regulatory proposals, you know, in a very fast and a very effective manner, you know, focusing on the technical considerations. This toolkit has also been expanded to include um, what we've called the internet enablers or the enablers of an open internet, which um, focus on the more non-technical aspects of um, internet functionality and internet development issues like um, the social cultural issues, the, the, the balance of participation you know, among players in the, in the internet industry and in the internet ecosystem and issues around digital rights and accountability and transparency. So all of these, um, I think this is one toolkit that is available to governments um, almost immediately, or I would say immediately, to be able to access uh, their regulatory intentions or their policy intentions internally. And we have worked at the Dear Government Organization with um, governments in Nigeria and um, across West African countries. Recently, we are, we are beginning a project with the Youth Standing Group where we'll be covering West African countries in this regard. Uh, and I think um, this is one toolkit that um, you know, you would find very useful, you know, if you're working in a governmental framework and then you, you are faced with these um, regulatory proposals that you think could undermine the progress and development of the internet. And I think, you know, part of this also answers the first question which um, Pedro put on the slide earlier that Innocent responded to. You know, these toolkits also provides um, very 
useful definitions um, and very useful clarifications around what are some of the desirables that we want to see in an internet that is inclusive and open and interconnected and free from jurisdictional and not shackled by jurisdictional barriers. And I also want to recommend to the policy committee that Emilia talked about earlier, a white paper that um, the Internet Society recently um, drafted on digital sovereignty, very, very insightful, very informative white paper. I think um, that committee would find it useful as well. Um, that is with regards to um, the first question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, just a uh, quick answer to him. Uh, okay, the, the question of the tech giants, I think it's not um, whether or not, but I think it, it should be because, I, uh, as I said, uh, I tried to rectify that uh, the actions, the series of actions that um, the different actors uh, tend to implement are the ones that could lead to a split internet. So I think it's not a question of whether or not, but a question of what of those actions by those tech giants and uh, how they could lead to a split internet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'd, I'd like to address the um, the speaker, I think from Brazil, who asked about, um, you know, the US-China um, uh, rift uh, on, on exports. Um, he said markets are transnational, but what's going on with the US? Uh, and uh, yeah, exactly, that's the point. Uh, their uh, market participants would be happy to sell chips to China. Uh, China would be happy to um, sell Huawei's equipment to the US, uh, but the interventions here are political. They are based allegedly on national security concerns, uh, really on sort of geopolitical competition. And this is the reason why I emphasize this disjunction between uh, states and the globally integrated digital ecosystem. I think uh, that's that's really the, the the fundamental thing that we're talking about. I would also like to uh, agree with um, Raul and and uh, another speaker who said that you know we we do need to be talking more about what to do about these things. I think it was Katerina uh, rather than uh, definitional questions. Uh, definitions are important to to you know make sure that we're talking about the same thing and it's good to have these discussions and there have been many of them but i think that the 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 key question is really what what do you do and uh, i agree with uh, wolfgang and generally the people in this environment have talked about the formation of new international institutions that can take over some of the governance problems that are posed by this global digital ecosystem. So uh, whether it's the dispute resolution system uh, for trademarks and domain names that ICANN set up, or the policymaking apparatus uh, of the regional internet registries, uh, or even something like the uh, global internet forum for counterterrorism, where you're dealing with content moderation on a transnational basis or the Christchurch call, um, those kinds of new institutional frameworks are, are the direction that we could go. And of course, that is controversial and difficult. And again, the countries that emphasize sovereignty will resist those initiatives because it will be a, a, a surrender of their exclusivity of power in favor of a global uh, institution. So you can expect uh, that to be a contentious issue, but I think some of these issues, not every issue, some issues can be solved domestically, but many of these issues need to be uh, pushing towards institutional innovation. Yeah, I want to take the question from the Tony Blair Institute and the unintended side effects from governmental regulation. So I, you know, prefer to use uh, smart regulation uh, because, you know, 20 years ago, regulation was seen as a barrier against innovation and uh, it would strangulate, you know, thinking out of the box. But today we have realized we need regulation. So in, in a third way, but what kind of regulation? And in so far, you know, smart regulation, which 
exactly defines what it wants to achieve is very important. And you can find it out uh, within a government with different ministries. And you have, it's the same in every country that foreign affairs, defense, interior, uh, health ministry have different ideas. The only way to settle this problem and to avoid unintended side effects is to have a broad multi-stakeholder discussion before you act. So that means that you bring all perspectives on board. A good example is the NIST 2 directive from the European Union. It was very understandable that the EU said we have to enhance cybersecurity, but then they went too far by including the root server for the DNS into the proposed legislation. So this would have undermined the security of the domain name system because this is managed by ICANN. And uh, in so far, it was very wise that after consultation with ICANN, uh, you know, this was taken out of the NIST 2 directive so that the root server is managed by the multi-stakeholder community and by ICANN. And if governments have a problem with that, they can use the governmental advisory committee and to give advice to the ICANN board how to enhance security of the root server system. But this is a distributed system and in so far uh, the recommendation to governments is be very careful, consult not only, but bring all the relevant stakeholders to the table, be aware about unintended side effects and act only where there is a need and not just to create big boxes where you put all the problems, wine and regulate in a top-down way. This is not, uh, the, the tradition is good, but we are moving towards the future and need new innovation uh, me uh, mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh, two people also uh, raised their hands uh, in the Zoom room. So firstly, I would like to let them also have their remarks. So uh, the first one would be Jorge Sancio. Uh, sorry if I pronounced it, it wrong. Uh, only for 30 seconds, so please be very brief. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I think uh, what gets lost a little bit in the discussion is that when there is an absence of rules and an absence of governance, mechanisms, what uh, occurs is that uh, power or might trumps rules and uh, small countries or small societies are not in a position of dictating rules like big corporation or like big economic uh, countries or big economic players. So uh, what I think is uh, that the splinters uh, and the fragmentation uh, are a consequence to a large extent of those big players uh, imposing their will uh, without really basing their decisions on an open and inclusive multi-stakeholder process at the global level. And there's where we have to, to work, to build stronger global inclusive institutions that really set the rules for the future of digital cooperation. So th that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Jorge. And uh, then I would also like to give a floor to Auke, who also raised his hand, also for 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would like to make two points. Uh, one, that we should make it impossible for um, some un democratic state actors to um, to touch the infrastructure of the internet. So we should all work together as technical community, as private sector to make it impossible to block, shut down or whatever to make it impossible for users to use the internet in a more, uh, in the way they would like to use it. Second, uh, content wise, um, that's a difficult topic and I also heard the remark from Wolfgang maybe we should moderate that in some way um, but that would be uh, to um, um, national governments for instance or um, private sector to make um, make the content 
um, that's online that that it doesn't um, uh, conflict with the laws they have in that certain country. Um, third, we should make possible that more democratic uh, ways are in place for those kinds of content moderation. Thanks. Uh, thank you a lot. We have run a, a bit out of time. We are very sorry for that, but we had to start it earlier because of some previous meetings delay. Uh, so if you could stay with us five more minutes, uh, speakers would make their closing remarks, just very brief ones, like 30 seconds, one minute, please. And also, if you're if we didn't have opportunity to listen to your question, uh, Pedro has shared the link to the Google document in the chat in the Zoom room. We'll also put it down in the session report in which you can uh, put all your questions and uh, we will pass them to speakers so they can also, uh, if they would like to, they can also respond to them. Respond to them. So uh, in this way, we would like uh, to hear all of your comments and questions because you know this format is very short, so it looks like it look. So, uh, starting maybe in the same order as previously, Innocent, uh, the floor is yours for your closing remark. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Emilia. So, I think um, we've discussed a lot, but uh, I think my take home is um, how do we go beyond coming to discuss or to understand what the split internet is to uh, under, uh, okay, the uh, both concepts actually. We all have different perspectives and um, some are deferring to the others, but how do we uh, uh, find a common ground to understand the two concepts? Then how do we work as stakeholders to find solutions to the issues at hand? Thank you. Thank you. Emmanuel? Yeah, I think as with every other type of relationship, communication is important. Um, we need more communication between government and other stakeholders in issues around digital sovereignty and display internet. You know, because we, are, we have seen that um, between um, intention and outcome that we see when it comes to regulatory matters around um, digital sovereignty and display internet, you know, along this continuum, there is a lot of love that is often lost. And then intent, by the time we begin to reconcile outcome with intent, we, we, we begin to see that the consequences are even more far reaching than any of the individual stakeholders would have um, pre-imagined before um, such outcomes manifested. So I think this necessitates more engagement. And um, like Wolfgang suggested, the multi-stakeholder model um, offers an approach, a useful approach for that. Thank you. Thanks, Wolfgang. Um, yes keep the uh, critical internet resources uh, which constitute the basic layer of the internet as neutral as possible and learn from climate change. There is no American air, there is no uh, Chinese air, there is polluted air or clean air. And keep the internet clean. There is no Chinese protocols or American protocols, so keep it as clean as possible and uh, uh, reject all efforts to uh, splinter the ground layer of the internet. Thank you. Steve? Uh, thank you so much for these discussions and for inviting me. Uh, we've taken a very good note, of course. <coughs> <coughs> this is an ongoing um, reflection and a critical issue for the Commission, and uh, these this, uh, IGF uh, conversations are extremely useful for us. I would just like to conclude with um, uh, a thought which is actually increasingly backed by um, empirical studies, uh, but the, it, I think it's in underlying this discussion and it's underlying our intuition, which is that we're here not discussing about the internet as such, because the internet is so embedded into the everyday life of citizens and politics that we're really discussing about this. And what we see, what we suspect that again, it's, it's on the table uh, recently by some geopolitical studies is that the more fragmented the internet is, the different, the more different the experience of the internet user is, so the different content that they encounter, the more exacerbated become the geopolitical differences. Uh, so a splintered internet is a splintered world. Uh, two internets are two worlds. 
Uh, two uh, protocols uh, in Africa are two Africas. Two uh, protocols in Europe are two Europe's. Very important that we solve this problem, that we find consensus. I think that human rights is really uh, a very important tool that we've been using in many instances, and uh, we should we should keep exploring the connection of human rights with the internet as much as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katerina. I would like to thank uh, to thank once again to all the participants for this debate, and indeed we've seen that again it's such a complicated issue, and it's becoming even more and more complex, and it's crippling from application layer to the technological layer to the transport layer, and while. Uh, we are all affected by this issue. The debate is becoming even, even more relevant these days and we need to find the common ground on which we stand and to start finding common solutions, at least the direction for that solutions. And innovative uh, um, inst institutions, multi-stakeholder approach can shed a light on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Milton. Yes, I'm just going to be, uh, you know, basically ceremonial here and say that I'm impressed with this um, organization of this panel by, by the youth group. Uh, I'm very happy you invited me. Uh, we have been working on these kinds of issues uh, at the Internet Governance Project for um, almost 20 years now. And uh, I would invite you to, to check out our site and stay in touch. We regularly blog on issues related to what we call the digital political economy and the growing uh, digital cold war, uh, which some of you might call a splinter net. Uh, so uh, stay informed and stay mobilized uh, in these global environments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you one more time to all our speakers and to our audience. Thanks everyone, have a nice lunch and good morning for those that like me and Professor Milton are in the America's time zones. <laughs> See you soon.